for a chat. Hello and welcome to another chat. This one is going to be about the Russian Navy's seabed warfare capabilities. Seabed warfare is something that people are starting to talk about more and more. It's something I've been writing about for many years, so I'm in a reasonable position to, to share this information with you. Seabed warfare basically means submarine operations on things that are underwater on the seafloor, so infrastructure and things, things like your internet cables, um, gas oil pipelines and things like that. Obviously, it's been in news a lot recently because of the Nord Stream uh, gas leaks, also because of various internet outages. And this video is not going to be about um, who did it, and it's not going to be about uh, conspiracy theories, and I don't subscribe to conspiracy theories, by the way, but it will cover the Russian Navy's capabilities in space, and it's intended to just complement and give you a, a reasonable grounding in that topic. There's a lot more to it than most people realize. And there is, of course, a reason why we've been talking about this, at least in the defense analysis space, for many years, because this capability is quite real and it's very extensive and more extensive in Russia than in other countries. Okay. So if you've not heard me before, I'm H.I. Sutton. I'm a defense analyst. I do videos explaining mostly submarine topics and, and other um, naval topics. Usual caveats apply. Also, this talk is unscripted and it's going to be unedited. That's just the way it is. It's just a guy talking about something he knows. I have prepared some material. So also apologies, my voice is still a bit croaky, but let's get on with it anyway. Let's see. All the recent news about internet cables and gas pipelines and things is very relevant. But I'm actually reminded of 1981, 41 years ago. This is the same time of year, October. In fact, right now, um, 41 years ago, there was a Russian submarine grounded just off a Swedish naval base. And of course, the strong suspicion, my suspicion, is that it was conducting intelligence gathering and something went wrong and it, it grounded itself. It was a major incident at the time. It was a whiskey class submarine, so it's known as Whiskey on the Rocks. It's part of a bigger picture. In the 1980s, there was a lot of seabed warfare going on. And the main areas people were talking about at the time were Sweden and to an extent Norway. And it was Cold War sort of stuff. And of course, there were for sure um, seabed warfare operations going on off Russia as well from the United States and so on. So seabed warfare isn't new, but the term is relatively recently um, becoming widely used and it's a capability that navies are looking at just recently the, the french navy for example actually initiated a program to get up to speed with it because they felt they'd fallen behind um, russia however has not fallen behind russia's program goes right back to 1960s and in parallel with the united states which you've, you've heard of um uh, operation uh ivy bells that's all re relevant from the United States perspective, Russia was also doing similar types of operations and developing capabilities. Um, this is a, a Zulu-class submarine with a Selga um, uh, sort of towed um, submersible, 1960s technology. So the timeline of Russian development quickly was in 1960s, they started, it was, you could view it as, as experiments, really, research and development, although they were for sure um, wanting to use them operationally. And then by 1970s, they started to have purpose-built nuclear-powered deep diving submersibles, like this is an X-ray class picture there. And then in the 1980s, they were starting to have incursions or be, or be suspected of incursions in uh, NATO and, and Western countries, particularly Sweden and Norway. The end of the Cold War, just at the beginning of the 1990s, decimated the Russian um, submarine force. The investment went right down, projects were cancelled. It was it was truly was a bad time for the submarine capabilities. And also in the West, every you know, most countries reduced their submarines capabilities. So this sort of capability, which is expensive and on the edge of core submarine capabilities, you'd expect to be reduced. But actually Against all the odds, they've increased the capabilities in this space since the 1990s, not reduced them. While they were cancelling projects, they, they were all the same building a submarine, which is quite well known, called Le Charic. This is 
a deep diving nuclear powered submarine. It's built of titanium. It's not cheap to build, even for the Russians. And it's famous because more, much more recently it caught fire and 14, 14 guys um, died uh, fighting that fire. But it, that is one of the things that highlights this unique capability that, that Russia has. There's no comparable submarines in the West or anywhere else. By the 2000s, they started converting some of their nuclear-powered uh, ballistic missile submarines to be even bigger host submarines. Um, they'd had some some in the past, but they were getting bigger and bigger. And by the 2010s, they'd started adding new technologies, including Western technologies, and also a new spy ship called Yantar, which we'll talk about, and it's also got a good reputation. So things are actually getting more capable and more investment. And that's quite remarkable. It's all centered on a unit which we call Guji. Okay, It translates as the main director of deep sea research. That's kind of a euphemism, um, typical. They just they list all the things they do. They don't say spying, but take it. Everyone in Russia and in the West would say, yeah, they're a spy organization. And these are independent of the other parts of the Navy. And they have submarines, nuclear pad submarines, and so on. So they're not civilian. They're based in, or they're headquartered in St. Petersburg, but their main operating base is Alenia Guba. This is like a secret base on the Kola Peninsula where their submarines and ships are based. Um, and their main area of operations is the sort of Russian area of the Arctic. Very roughly highlighted here. Um, but including the White Sea, Barents Sea, of course, um, that's where you expect them to be operating in their home turf. But they are, of course, also operating in the Norwegian Sea, the UK, Iceland gap, and so on. Again, very crudely highlighted. Also, particular North Atlantic and North Sea, particularly around the UK and Ireland, have a lot of internet cables and things. Um, that's a hot area. The Baltic, of course, which is where um, Nord Stream was attacked, coincidentally, you know, um, just for context and the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. They have capabilities there, absolutely. Um, particularly the Black Sea, Mediterranean, they would sail from other places to reach. Okay. These are the main areas where we see and talk about Guji. But absolutely, they have a global reach. And with their nuclear powered submarines and their surface ships, they can go more or less anywhere. Um, their service ships have definitely operated near the United States. And submarines, we can speculate. So they do have a global reach pretty much. But the main areas north, you know, think of the Arctic, the Barents Sea and so on. What are they doing? What is seabed warfare all about? It's warfare applied to underwater infrastructure, really. And either placing or attacking or maintaining that type of infrastructure, such as energy infrastructure, oil, gas, power, cables. Um, obviously, Nord Stream would be in that category. Also, internet cables gets a lot of news. Um, there's a lot of internet cables under the sea, very prone to attack. Military communications, the cables that are not on the maps. And sensor networks. So in old money, this would be things like SOSUS, but basically the infrastructure designed to protect a country against um, enemy submarines or service ships, but particularly submarines. And lastly, wrecks of various types, warships and, and aircraft particularly, but you know, anything that's just fallen onto the seafloor. And with all of these, there is both a defensive and an offensive application. So they can be deploying or in, in, you know um, putting things in place, um, repairing, monitoring, delousing, which would be to go along a cable or a pipe looking for enemy um, planted devices and of course sabotage so which you do on ad adversary infrastructure um, in terms of jets and things they they we know for sure that they dive on the wrecks of their own aircraft to fall off aircraft carriers which happened in the Mediterranean a few times and they would definitely want to dive on the western aircraft that have crashed and gain the technology from them and so on The backbone of this and what makes the Russian capability unique, really, is the special mission submarines. 
they have a large fleet of purpose designed submarines this these are this is my current estimate of the operational ones there's a couple more that are mothballed or or um you could i could add more to this picture put it that way but of note they've got two very large host submarines or mother submarines which carry the smaller submarines you see in the middle and these are among the biggest submarines in the world the only comparable submarine that i can think of that you know anyone would think of is the uss jimmy carter in the u.s navy that's a single submarine and it's much smaller than those delta class submarines at the top of this illustration to put that in context only russia has a fleet of submarines like this they're all nuclear powered except the two little sort of nemo looking ones the the bester um and they can operate at incredible depths the the smaller host submarines can go down to a thousand meters easily three thousand feet um probably much more possibly by some of them down to six thousand meters so this is an example of submarine in fact this is the main submarine right now <laughs> sorry um let's unpack this a bit it's a ballistic missile submarine that has been had uh, that has been modified it's had the missile tubes which normally sort of stand upright just the same as on the western ones it's had those removed and an extended hull section inserted instead and that is to allow it to carry a deep diving submersible sort of docked underneath and it carries that to the operating area and the submersible is more for going up and down than a lot and the main example of this is low sharik which as i'm which is the one drawn and it's quite large on the outside but small on the inside because it's these a series of titanium orbs or balls inside and i'd say this can dive to a thousand meters or three thousand feet easily um probably deeper it's made of titanium it's nuclear powered it's quite interesting in itself Lusharik suffered an accident and there's a couple of older Paltus class submarines that they might be still using probably are still using in its place there's talk about how they're going to replace it repair it and so on it's a little bit unknown but there is a cheaper and easier way that they can do it which is a deep diving um rescue submersible dsrv the latest one which is called besta um and russia has a whole series of these these submersibles but the latest one if you look closely at the front of it you'll see that it's got manipulator arms it's designed and advertised it's it's not a secret that it is capable of seabed warfare and seabed infrastructure work as well as rescuing people it's not solely for rescuing people so it can carry that on the back and we've we've observed that it also has a dedicated hangar for underwater uncrewed underwater vehicles or autonomous underwater vehicles to use the, the how russia would describe it this is the clavsin or harpsichord in in english and it's the main main type and it's a dedicated hangar on submarine other navies don't do this this is something that other navies would be a little bit envious of it's quite a good capability should add that these submarines still have torpedoes and weapons and sonar they're still they're they're very capable submarines in their own right they're not just um a, a mother <laughs> sorry a mothership there's also ships that they can use in particular some dedicated spy ships and these are operated by guji and the most famous and most important really is yanta and that's the one pictured i will talk a little bit more about her in a moment but they can also use other survey or scientific research ships and these some of these are op operated by the navy some of them by scientific institutions and so on and these give a higher level of deniability if you're doing covert or offensive actions even more deniable you could use other naval vessels which are not designed for seabed warfare but are all the same quite suited for example various tugs and auxiliary ships and this is just a general a generic example of an auxiliary ship i'm not acute and not suggesting that that particular ship is doing seabed warfare at that time and then lastly you can use civilian vessels this is the most deniable of course um and 
certain types of civilian vessel. This is just a random trawler I found, a Russian trawler, but it's I'm not making any accusations against that ship individually. But you can use fishing vessels, trawlers, factory ships, um, offshore um, resupply or offshore work vessels, of course. Uh, super yachts would be particularly ideal. There's a lot of ships they could use. Going back to Yanta, though, this one is Guji operated. It's got quite a lot of tech in there, but uh, in particular, I've highlighted that at the back, it carries remote operated vehicles, which can be um, sent down to investigate things on the seafloor, do, do mapping, that sort of thing. It also has deep diving submersibles. So these are the ones that can go to 6,000 meters. So they can go anywhere in the world's oceans, pretty much. And this ship is the one that's been accused or suspected of operating over other countries or internet cables, possibly implementing, you know, um, very well, at the minimum, mapping them uh, for future operations. I've got an article on this on my website, of course. Um, there's a lot of analysis on this ship. This ship has gone dark recently. Just, um, I don't want to talk about who who did what or or anything on Nord Stream, that sort of stuff. But I will say that this ship has been active in the Arctic for the last few months. Um, there's no suggestion it's been in the Baltic for over a year. Okay. Capabilities are evolving. There was a time not so long ago, particularly in the 2000s, when Russia started importing Western technologies. Um, this is on the left, you've got the ARS 600. That's an example. It's Canadian built. Um, and there's another small submersible behind it. These are particularly suited to seabed warfare. They're, they're advertised, or, or Russia suggests that they're using them to, to help rescue sailors from submarines. But the application in seabed warfare is obvious. There was other equipment. I'm not don't want to point at the Canadians particularly. There was there's for sure um British and Swedish um uh remote operated vehicles and things like that. A lot of it is because seabed warfare by its nature is ambiguous and particularly around um oil and gas industry and in russia where there isn't much separation between any of the state-run enterprises you know the uh the technology can be imported as dual use and then misused of course but there's increasingly indigenous projects and initially that's because of sanctions and just a need to fill the gap with indigenous products which tended not to be as good but over time they are evolving and some interesting ideas coming out of russia that you don't see elsewhere for example um this device on the right is a small relatively small underwater vehicle you can see people's hands on the right of the pictures for scale but it's got a manipulator arm and this is unusual i can't think of other examples um this was a science project a university it's gone quiet but it's an interesting line of thinking and it's not unreasonable to suspect that this knowledge and or technology could be applied but uh, remote operated vehicles um submersibles there's there's a lot of work replacing um imported equipment with indigenous equipment another thing that can operate on cables especially in shallow water are divers and there's two general families the combat diver on the left spetsnaz um and what we'll simplistically call technical divers or naval divers the spetsnaz would be um your typical special forces and the Navy divers would be probably, well, generally associated with Guji. Um, it's a little bit opaque how exactly how they're set up. You'll notice that both guys um, are wearing a lot of Western equipment again. This is, I say, is over time going to be replaced by Russian equipment. Um, you know, it is, I can see French, um, German, probably American and possibly Italian um, equipment there. Just looking at that picture. Okay. Another capability which I have to take very seriously are ma marine mammal programs, including variations of seabed warfare in their operations, and particularly the beluga whales in the Arctic. This is one that turned up in Norway, quite famous. Um, I think there is serious reason to consider them as part of the intelligence apparatus of the Russian Navy. For example, this is a satellite image of Alenia Guba. This is Guji's main base. So this is the 
the main director of of undersea research or spying as everyone would say and it's a closed base you can't just walk there uh, it's like a secret base on the Kola Peninsula and there's a few things going on bottom right uh, sorry, bottom left, apologies. You've got Yantar. Then you've got two host submarines. These are the, the really large submarines. And then in that hangar in the middle, there are the deep diving submarines like the Sharik. Just Google Earth image from a few years ago. Still stands for today, though. And if you look at the top, there's this tiny sort of round thing. That is a pen for belugas. And, and I'm confident of that. That's not just idle speculation. That is a beluga pen. Um, so they have moved and operate their belugas as part of the marine mammal program at their Guji site, um, which is extremely telling and associates those marine mammals with intelligence gathering. I don't think they're just there for protection. Lastly, just to close it out, there is, of course, the submarine Belgorod. This is quite famous and well-known. It's only just been commissioned this year. It's the largest submarine built for 30 or more years since the only submarine in the world that's ever been bigger is the typhoon class um which is quite famous and cool in its own right but i think of it as massive and it's a little bit confusing it has seabed warfare capabilities it can carry the sharik and or other deep diving submersibles under its belly in the same way that the um the other host submarines can it can also carry things on its back same way but the confusion is that it is also armed with Poseidon or potentially carries Poseidon weapons. And these are nuclear powered nuclear um, armed torpedoes with an exceptional intercontinental range. They're a super weapon, one of Putin's super weapons. They're to be taken very seriously, but it's a conflict of of roles there. Um, there's a question mark. If you're carrying the Poseidon on a nuclear deterrent patrol, you won't be doing seabed warfare and vice versa. So right this second this submarine although it is technically operational it's something to come and we haven't yet seen it being used in seabed warfare but it is designed for it okay and belgorod also just to mention was operating in the arctic the last few months i've been tracking that and there's been some articles on it okay so thank you ever so much hopefully this was interesting and useful let's say i didn't want to go into conspiracy theories or or even theories too much um but thank you for listening if you like it please subscribe please share and once again apologies for the audio and unscripted nature thank you